Okay, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome again to the Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies. Today, we have one of our senior professors in the house, uh, Professor Grace Jocktan, the Director of ESETA, former Dean of Faculty of Agriculture, former HOD, former Director of this and that, a great mentor and someone that is always about service speaking to us and sharing with us uh, invaluable experiences and knowledge. The title of our paper is Human Migration and the Evolution of Livestock Diversity, the case of rabbits and small ruminants in Nigeria. Uh, this is a global study, as you will hear uh, present. When you hear rabbit, it's not just about rabbits in Nigeria, but with root and history in what is today Western Europe. Human migration and evolution of livestock is also global, both in context and in diversity, as you will hear Professor Jokchan present to us today. In fact, I was so delighted reading this and I have to reach out to look at my history, PowerPoints and teaching notes to see whether or not I still remember the evolution of man and animals uh, within the context of migration. Uh, Professor Jokchan, you have 40 minutes, ma'am, to present and uh, I will continue to share. Just tell me next slide or direct me as appropriate. So 40 minutes, yeah, then we move on to question and answer. You have the virtual space, ma'am. Thank you. Can you enlarge it, please? Uh, this is as far as I can go. I'm sharing slide. I'm not doing uh, editing. And I'm sharing from my uh, uh, iPad. You probably want to open on your, on your laptop or desktop without sharing. Of course, you can't share and then you can read from there. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, my colleagues. I, I appreciate uh, the presence of everyone in this meeting. Uh, my paper is titled Human Migration and the Evolution of Livestock Diversity the case of rabbits and small ruminants in Nigeria. Uh, the paper is divided into uh, segments. Uh, the first segment talks about the history of the rabbits and small ruminants and how they got to Nigeria. The second aspect talks about the spread of this species in country, as well as the contribution of this uh, species to livestock diversity and uh, the intake of protein within the country. The paper looks at factors that enable both the rabbits and the small ruminants to remain resilient and be able to thrive within the ecosystem they have found themselves and drew conclusions on uh, on what needs to be done to ensure that these uh, animals reach the production potentials that they ought to have. And so the paper is actually a review and the methodology used was to look at uh, literature in the form of survey of literature related to rabbits and small ruminants. It is, we also did some personal interviews to solicit information from people that have uh, been raising these animals. There are also personal research findings. I have actually worked on small ruminants during my master's thesis and have done a bit of research relating to that. And we also looked at some published data as well as doctoral thesis 
in the Department of Animal Science uh, at the Amadovello University. That is the methodology that was used to derive the information I will be sharing in the course of this uh, meeting. And so I took the definition of Encyclopedia Britannica 2020 for human migration to put the paper in context. And that definition refers to the permanent change of residence by an individual or group. It excludes such movement as nomadism, migrant labor, commuting, and tourism, all of which are transitory in nature. So I try to trace the history as the movement of animals on a more permanent basis as the livestock evolve outside the environment they had initially or originally existed. And that gives the background to the early human migration story. And so we know that early humans migrants were actually hunters and those that also gather uh, uh, crops about and who live continually and move in search of food supplies. Humans are thought to have occupied all continents except Antarctica within a span of about 50,000 years. So within 50,000 years of known history, man has been able to occupy all continents except one, which is Antarctica, that, was, that is actually very cold and they were also not able to live within that region. Then came the transition from migratory hunting and gathering to migratory slash and born agriculture. The consequence was the rapid geographical spread of crop and livestock. Slash and born agriculture refers to the clearing of forests and the use of such cleared environment for planting of uh, crops. And thus begin the establishment of a sedentary uh, farming. The next pulse of migration began around the 14,000 to, to, to 4,000 to 3,000 BC, and this was as stimulated by the development of seagoing vessels and of pastoral nomadry. At that Sorry, Prof, uh, we, we lost your audio. You lost you my can, audio? Yeah. Okay, go ahead now. Okay, that has Thank to do with movement of people on the sea. And that is the story we have of Christopher Columbus and so on that actually moved on water from one place to another. It is important to note that in the movement of these humans from one place to another, they actually carried some livestock with them and we are able to now, uh, we're able to establish livestock in other places where they otherwise were not in existence. As they move over the overseas, it brought about long distance trading. This long distance trading introduced the settlements of people along, along the shores or islands. And because of this settlement along the shores or islands, animals were introduced in different places. And the long distance movement enabled settlement and care of these animals within those uh, areas. This is what brought about a pastoralist system that populates the extensive grass, grassland of the European state, as well as Africa and the Middle East savannas. This brings us to the history of the domestic rabbit. The domestic rabbit is referred to as the Oritolagus coniculus. It has evolved about 4,000 years ago in what was then known as Iberia, currently known as Southwestern Europe, and covers countries such as Portugal, Spain, and Western France. In fact, part of Iberia was then referred to as the Esifan, 
which means land of the rabbits, which means around that time, there were rabbits within uh, Iberia around 4,000 years ago. The rabbit's journey from Iberia, where it originally um, was found, actually was due to the movement of the Romans. And these Romans took the rabbit to Italy as a source of food. This occurred around the 19th century. As of today, there are millions of rabbits throughout Europe, as well as part of North Africa. Australia, New Zealand, and South America. Indeed, the world over. The rabbit has been able to move through trading, through continental shifts, and they are now found almost in all parts of the world, except the very cold area of Antarctica, where these uh, rabbits do not find it uh, very comfortable to exist. And so what are the population of the rabbits around the world? This uh, table by Lukefa 1992 gives us the distribution of rabbits around the world. This is to say that this animal that originated around France and Portugal is now found within all continents of the world. And the figures are there for you to see in terms of the distribution world over. You will notice that in this table, Nigeria is not uh, reflected. Nigeria falls under other countries. And for other countries, you have about 120,000 metric tons. This table gives the figures in 1,000 metric tons. Can we go on, please? Hello. <laughs> And so we have traced the history from Iberia, France, um, Portugal. We have been able to understand it got to, uh, it got to move around as a result of trading and as a result of sea voyaging. We are now at the point where it's, the rabbit has been in Africa, at the horn of Africa. How did this rabbit become uh, domesticated within the Nigerian country. And so, as early as uh, around 1960, the United States Department of Agriculture was involved in the introduction of rabbit to Western states in Nigeria. That is how it began to move deeper into the country in Nigeria. There was the need to increase protein intake and rabbit was seen as an animal that can easily meet that demand within a short period. And therefore, the USDA uh, planned the movement or the introduction of this animal to the Western states of Nigeria. And between 1988 to 1989, the Directorate of Food, Road, and Rural Infrastructure was also involved in the importation of pure and improved breeds of rabbits. This is by Adupu and Olukosi, 1990. These improved breeds have since adapted to the tropical environment and are now widely distributed within the country. The total population of rabbits in Nigeria is about 1.7 million. This is what is uh, stated as the current number of rabbits in Nigeria. It is important to note that world over, the rabbit population is about 7 million. Having come to Nigeria and having been distributed to the western part of Nigeria, the rabbit now became popular even within other parts of the country, such as the northern states, through the distribution of agricultural development projects, as well as um, movement of people from north to south within the country. This is what accounts for the spread of the rabbit all over the country as of today, and it is not localized to any geographical zone as it were. The rabbit uh, 
uh, having come, there are a lot of breeds of this, this animal over the years. In developed countries, specific breeding programs have been developed to actually uh, evolve a breed that is suit for a particular purpose. A lot of the, the, the developed countries actually have some breeds that are just as pets. They are just quite small and do not grow big. In some places, you also have the medium sized breeds and you also have the large size breeds. In Nigeria, these ones I'm portraying here are actually the common breeds that you find within the country. And so you have the California white, you see it looking white with the ears and the nose black. You have the Dutch that is mostly black but has a, a, a belt of white on the body. You also have the lobe that is having very large and droopy ears. You have the Angora. This breed has not been successfully adopted to the Nigerian environment. It has a lot of hair, and you all know that the temperature in this uh, area does not, is not so suitable for such uh, animals. But for pet purposes and for aesthetic purposes, you find it in certain farms and also certain homes. The cinchilla, I'm sure, is one of the common ones you have seen around. And the color is normally earth uh, brown or a bit darker than that. And you also have the New Zealand white rabbit. The last one there is the Flemish giant. It has been introduced not too long ago, but it is surviving comfortably. This is the large breed of rabbits that is known to be up to five to six kg in terms of mature weight. These other ones we have talked about are normally between three to four kg in weight. But the Flemish giant is actually a large size uh, rabbit. Can we go on? Hello? Can we move on? Okay. And so what is the nutritional value of rabbits? And what is the diversity that it has been able to create in terms of animal protein intake? I want to say that the presence of the rabbit in our environment has created additional species of livestock to the existing uh, species that were originally within the African context. And so we have an additional uh, variety of livestock and it has also contributed in terms of protein supply to the total protein intake within the, the country. If you look at the first table in yellow, you will notice that the, in terms of nutritional value, the rabbit is about 40.15%. This is actually higher than what you have in the chicken, in the pork, in the veal, and in the beef. In, that is to say that in terms of nutritional status of the meat, it is better than most of the ones that we actually have around. Can we go back, please? We are going up. Can you bring it down, please? Uh -huh. And then if you look at the cholesterol level, most of us that are getting old now are concerned about the intake of cholesterol, and we are trying to find all means ways to reduce the cholesterol value of our food. The rabbit meat has a very low cholesterol value. You can see it having 45 milligram per 100 gram. When you compare that to the other conventional livestock species we have on that table, you will see that it is actually much lower. And therefore, rabbit meat is regarded as the meat of health. It is regarded as meat that is recommended for aging people, people that have issues of heart disease or heart problems are actually required to eat more of rabbit meat. In terms of 
pro, uh, in terms of mineral content, particularly iron, still in milligram per 100 gram, you will realize that it also has a high iron content. So it has a high mineral content in terms of minerals. It has low cholesterol, and it has also a high nutritional value. That is the status of the rabbit in the society that most people do not know or do not recognize the value in terms of nut nutrition that this animal contributes to the, the human population. The graph there presents the percentage of fat. It is, if you look at that graph, you will notice that the rabbit, which is in the blue, actually has the least fat content. It has the least fat in terms of unsaturated fats. I'm sure we all know that saturated fats are actually the ones that are not too good for us. The unsaturated fats are easily digestible, do not cause heart problems, and they are in the form of oleic and linolenic acids. And this is quite high, quite um, such, uh, quite low in the rabbit. So when you want to eat rabbit meat, you are, the content of fat that you are eating is actually unsaturated fat. The fat is low, and even that one that is available is actually the unsaturated fat. But you can see that of the pork that is as high as 45. You can even see chicken still being higher than that of uh, in the rabbit, even though we are asked to eat um, uh, white part of the chicken meat and not uh, to eat the back. Now, in terms of, um, can, can you reduce the, this thing a little bit? In terms of recommended protein intake, 55 grams per day is recommended as a reasonable protein uh, to be consumed by humans. Out of that, it is recommended that at least 70% should come from animal protein. And that is to say we are expected to eat at least about 39 grams per day from animal protein source for good health. The current intake of protein in Nigeria is about 32 grams per day by OADG 2014. And this takes us to about 22.4 grams of animal protein that is being consumed. This, there is therefore a shortfall in the total amount of protein that the average Nigerian consumes. How do we increase the protein intake to be able to meet the recommended uh, FOA value for uh, human development? That is where I, I stop on the issue of the rabbit. We will meet it somewhere later. But let me introduce here the small ruminants, the meaning and its origin. What is a ruminant? A ruminant animal is actually an even toed hoofed four leg mammal that eats grass and plant materials. These animals include cattle, sheep, goats, bison, buffalo, deer, antelopes, giraffes, and camels. Typically, a ruminant has a four compartment stomach. That is what the, the ruminant, uh, that is Sorry, man, we lost your audio. We lost your audio, if you can hear us, man. Prof, are you there with us? We lost your audio. Sorry, Prof, we lost your audio.
we're having challenges uh, reaching Prof, if you can hear us. But I think I'll just uh, continue on our behalf, but my continuation will be basically, are you back with us, Isitel, now? So it will be basically to just read. I am not an expert in this uh, field, as you will all know. Uh, Professor Jokchan was trying to tell us about ruminant, and she described the meaning of a ruminant in the context of uh, the origin of of the animal. Ruminants include domestic cattle. Yeah, we can hear her if she is back. Prof, can you? Okay, is it uh, okay? I'll ask you to unmute. Unmute yourself, Prof, if you can hear us. If you can hear me. Uh, I can. Okay, can go ahead, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so I had defined what the ruminant is. And when you hear small ruminants, we are actually referring to sheep and goats. So sheep and goat is the short form of uh, the name small ruminants. And sheep and goats belong to the uh, genus Ovis and Capra. So sheep is actually Ovis aries, while goat is Capra hicos. These are the biological names for these uh, animals. The, they are domestication. Sheep was domesticated over 8,000 years ago in Africa along the river Nile, which is around Egypt. So it is around the river Tigris and Euphrates, and also some of them are found within the Indian continent. The goats are domesticated about the same time with the sheep, and it is found in our southwestern America and eastern Europe. These were the original origin of where these domestic animals were found. In terms of population, can we go to the next one? In terms of their distribution and population, the woolly sheep was developed around 6,000 BC and they were introduced to Africa from these uh, traders as we, as we have talked earlier. This is by Simmons 2001. We all know that the woolly sheep was a very big enterprise in developed countries where the temperate temperature is quite low and they therefore needed some form of clothing in order to keep warm. And so this breed was actually developed much earlier within the temperate region. The first sheep entered North Africa via Sinai. We have, only, we have already talked about the uh, river Tigris and Euphrates that is found around there. And they were present in ancient Egypt between 8,000 to 7,000 7, years ago. Sheep and goats have also been part of subsistence farming in Africa. But today, the only country that keeps significant numbers of commercial sheep is South Africa. Nigeria has a higher population, but not at an economic uh, level. In Nigeria, small ruminants initially were in the hands of the Fulani headsmen. Were in the hands of the Fulani headsmen and pastoralists that were able to move from one place to the other. This map, as you can see, gives you the spread of the small ruminants within the country. In the north, they are the number is larger, representing about 44%. In the east, there are about 14. 
around the central and uh, central part of Nigeria, they are about 19%, and in the south, they are about 24%. Uh, Nigeria has the largest small ruminant head in Africa. It is followed by Sudan, Chad, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And there are about 73.8 million goods and 42.1 million sheep that are mostly indigenous. Unlike the rabbits that we are talking about to introduce um, purebreds and crossbreds, the sheep and goat population are mostly indigenous and actually originated around the Horn of Africa. Some ruminants are kept by uh, small gold farmers for meat, hides, wool, and to a less, lesser extent, milk. In fact, the, West Af uh, the, the, the famous Moroccan leather is actually the skin of one of the Nigerian breeds of goods known as the Red Sokoto goat. That, during the colonial era, had earned Nigeria a lot of money in terms of foreign exchange. And even before the advent of the oil boom, it was one of the major sources of foreign exchange in the country. They simply export the skin, uh, treat it, add value to it, and return it to us as, as finished products. And it is referred to as a Moroccan leather. But the origin is actually the Red Sokoto boot. The small ruminant population is concentrated in the northern part of the country. They mostly eat grass. And in the south, there isn't a, a large population of low grass that these animals can easily eat. Can we go to the next one? This one gives us the, the uh, foreign exchange that can be uh, obtained from the goods when sold. So what are the breeds of goods that we ship and goods that we find in Nigeria? In terms of sheep, you can see the white one there is the Yankasa sheep. It has large horns and, and uh, black ears. You can see the Balami that looks completely white. And you can also see the Uda that has a pied color in front. It can be black or brown in front, but it is white at the back. In terms of goat population and breeds, we have the desert goat. You can see it uh, here looking white. The desert goat can be multicolored, and so it can take any form of color. But the important thing to look at in the desert goat is the dispro disproportionate size of the legs. It has long legs compared to the trunk. This is an adaptive ability that enables it to move long distance within the desert area in search of uh, food. You have the red Sokoto that I've uh, earlier talked about. The body is dark brown in color. There are several variants of this red Sokoto that is found, and the color seems to change a bit as you move from the north to the south. And so you have some variants such as the Cano Brown or the, the Plateau Brown. All these are actually variants of the Red Sokoto goat. You now have the West African Dwarf, commonly found in the southern part of the country. It is a short breed with uh, almost dwarf legs. They call it a chondroplastic dwarf. It has multicolors. It is compact and has a lot of meat. But one of the important features of this breed is that it is trypanotolerant and therefore can live within the trypanosome endemic area of the South without uh, becoming sick. This was very important in the earlier days when there was a lot of uh, foray, forest cover in the South. These days, it is becoming clearer as a result of human uh, habitation and human clearing and agriculture is no longer as dense as it used to be. And so even the trypanosomes are moving further inwards and leaving a clearer area for uh, humans as well as
can we go to the next one on the contribution of small uh, of rabbits and small ruminants to protein supply in Nigeria? Uh, the picture you are seeing is uh, is the various products that are obtained from these. Uh, either rabbits or small ruminants. You can see the rabbit meat as the first one. It looks white. It is actually white meat. It is almost, uh, it is as in the same class with chicken and fish in terms of uh, uh, the quality of the meat. You can see the dairy goods. In, in foreign countries, there's actually a dairy breed of wood that is meant for milk. And milk production from such breeds are known, are known to exceed three kilograms per milking. And so within a day, you can obtain up to five kilograms of milk from a good milking. This milk has a lot of nutritional value. It is more digestible than the cow milk. It also does not give itself to um, allergy. Some people are allergic to cow milk. This goat milk does not uh, cause any allergic reaction. It has a lot of value in the cosmetic industry. And in, in some Fulani settlements, they actually give the goat milk to their children. So when they, they have young children, they actually feed them on goat milk. This is an indication that they actually have knowledge of the value of this uh, product. In Nigeria, we have not yet developed our breed to be able to classify them into this uh, category. And so generally, our animals are mostly for uh, meat. You also have the sheep meat. You can see the sheep meat here, also referred to as mutton. The sheep meat and the goat meat are all red meat, but there's a distinct difference between the two. The sheep meat has within it embedded fat, while the goat meat is a leaner form of meat. And so should you be looking for uh, meat that has less fat content, you are, uh, I will advise that you go for the goat meat because in the goat, the fat is actually laid on the outer body and not embedded within the meat. While in the, uh, in the sheep, the fat is embedded within the muscular tissue of the meat and therefore has a higher fat content if you want to eat it. In the next uh, table, I will, I will be making some difference so that you can be able to determine which way you want to go, depending on your, your health as well as your taste in terms of uh, what you want to consume. And so when you look at the sheep meat, you realize it is red, which similar nutrient content as that of the beef or the pork. And naturally it is tender and no need, there is no need, no age effect on the meat. You know that the amount, the, uh, the presence of fat actually increases meat tenderness. So that is what is being uh, reflected there. There is also less marbling, that's what we have said earlier. It is easy to digest and it is favored for various uh, Christian, Muslim, as well as Jewish religious uh, festival. It has a distinct flavor. The meat has a distinct flavor. While if you are looking at the goat, the meat is lean, it is red, but it is lean. You have, it is lower in fat than other red meats. And the, my, it has a mild flavor and taste. Because of the less fat content, the taste is also a little lower than what you have in the lamb. And age of the animal is less of a concern. In terms of rabbits, 
we have talked about this table, I think, earlier that talks about um, the, uh, that compared the nutrient value of rabbit with uh, the rest of livestock. So I wouldn't go there again. It is just to indicate that the rabbit meat is better than others, even better than the lamb, as well as the mutton that we, we were talking about. Can we go to the next one? Can we go to the next slide? You are there, man. Thanks. Okay, what are the factors that ensure resilience of rabbits and small ruminants? We have been able to de determine that these animals existed somewhere. They have been brought to our environment. We have seen the population of these animals within our environment. We have also seen the nutritional value or the contribution of these species to the protein intake. The next thing to look at is how have these animals been able to survive in the new environment, thrive in the new environment, and be able to multiply in this new environment that they have been brought. And so these animals are said to be resilient. And by resilience, we mean the ability of vulnerable systems, whether they are countries, whether they are regions, whether they are species, to withstand, recover from, adapt to, and potentially transform amid change and uncertainty. And this is what this uh, class of livestock we are talking about have been able to do. They have been able to adapt, they have been able to potentially transform themselves amid the change and uncertainty. And they have been able to recover uh, diverse uh, situations, that, to recover from diverse situations they have been exposed to. It is important to note at this point that when the rabbit was introduced to Australia, where it had very little predators, it so multiplied that within the next 30 years, it has become a problem to the society. And so at some point, even in, in Australia, they had to do some form of biological control to be able to manage the number of ruminants that were, the number of rabbits that were in existence. And so they released a virus uh, which killed a lot of them. But it's important to note that the surviving ones developed resistance and multiplied. And today they are close to what they were at the initial stage. This is to say that this animal is actually resilient and can thrive in different uh, environments and ecological zones. And so one of the factors that have brought about this resilience is actually the adaptability to environment. We saw the map we have shown and we saw the data we had presented showing the presence of these animals in both temperate and tropical environments. They have been able to, to adapt to environmental changes. They are also resistant to disease. They don't easily fall ill, both sheep, goats, as well as the rabbits are not as sickly as you compare to the poultry and therefore do not need as much uh, attention. I've just talked about the facts uh, of the West African dwarf that we said is resistant to trypanosomiasis. This has enabled it to survive and we saw that the, it had about 24% in terms of population in the country. They have a fast growth rate. Rabbits are animals that are born blind, hairless, and very tender. But if you give the rabbit the next two weeks, you will be surprised at how fast it, it will grow. The hair will be fully on, eyes open, and the animal will be able to move about within the nest. This is a sign of fast growth 
great. And that has enabled it to survive. By the time the rabbit is two months old, it will be all over the place. In fact, breeding starts at the age of four months in rabbits. That is the same with the sheep and goats. The goats are given birth to at a stage when they are even able to move about. Immediately it is born, it can move about. And so the growth rate is fast and the ability to survive is also high. They are highly prolific. If you are talking about, if you are talking about the number of kittens per liter, the rabbit, one rabbit can have as much as 12 liters in one parturition. And that number of 12 liters can start producing in the next four months and give birth to another 12. And it is important at this point for me to mention that the rabbit are spontaneous ovulators. That is to say that the act of mating leads to the release of eggs. So even if a rabbit were to, to deliver today or to, to keep today, and in the next two days, a, a male rabbit is around, the chances of the female becoming pregnant, even with that number of litter is very, very high because they are spontaneous ovulators. That gives you the lifestyle- One minute, limit. Prof. These animals can multiply. Thank you. And so we are talking about high fecundity, the ability to regenerate themselves fast. And we are also saying that there are non-seasonal breeders, both sheep and wood. In foreign countries, they don't breed during the winter, but in Africa, they do throughout. And so by way of conclusion, I will say that the rabbits have been introduced to Africa and indeed Nigeria from the Western Europe where they have originated from and they have been here now with us these livestock species have over the years adapted to the climate environment as well as the feed resources we have in nigeria and have also have some morphological changes for adaptability several breeds have evolved contributing to the diversity of indigenous livestock available for human consumption I will, however, add that not much has been done in terms of plant breeding to be able to develop species that will produce at a higher rate to be able to meet the protein deficiency gap. This is an, op an opening for a lot of breeding work to be done in order to develop the Nigerian breed of sheep and goats as well as rabbits that will meet the need of our times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Doctor. Thank you very much. They are clapping for you already. This is brilliant. Uh, let us go ahead and unshare so that I can see everyone. I thank you very much. I thank the Vice Chancellor for joining us. I thank the Council Member Malam Isa Shewu for joining us. Uh, Professor Kagbari, we thank you, sir, for always being there. Uh, we have learned a lot again, and I have quite a number of uh, people that have shown interest to um, to speak, either as question or comment. Uh, I think the deputy director and technical advisor to the ears of Ted Fund. I'm trying to locate. If we are here and I can locate your name in the uh, participant, kindly let me know, sir, so that I can call you. Uh, you send me a text that you would like to speak. Um, we will take it in this order, the comment and questions. Uh, let me see. And I will unmute or ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, Mubarak, I, I will not like to read, I would like to just call in this order. Uh, Mubarak, Mubarak is uh, one of the pioneer Ted Fund Morgan Scholar, being his PhD, I'm trying to look for you. I will unmute you 
Uh, that is Mubarak. Uh, there's one Sunday, something that also indicated uh, someone on user mem leaving us. I asked you to unmute. Um, Gideon Adamu. Please, if your area is noisy, just kindly uh, mute yourself until you are ready, please. It helps us when we are editing the video. Um, I will unmute Professor Okagbari. Uh, I'm going to unmute uh, another Ted von Morgan scholar, ring him. He has presented before. Uh, the vice chancellor, it doesn't like me to say that at this forum, uh, but Professor Abdallah Obadamu will speak after all these young people are working. Uh, I'm looking for that Sunday, somebody's Sunday. But please, if you have, the, you can have the floor. Okay, Sunday, Adama Gideon on mute. So you have 10 seconds each. Whoever would like to go first should please go in that order. And okay. I will mute. Uh, okay, so, this so is Okay. Mubarak. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Mubarak. Okay. Uh, my question was, uh, I think uh, I read one article that says uh, goat meat is one of the most nutritious uh, and healthier meat among the ruminant animals. So I just want to know how scient scientifically proven is that? Okay. Thank you very much. Please go, go ahead and, and mute yourself. Okay. The next person, please. Next person that I've unmuted or asked to unmute. Can you go ahead, the, the one living us? Please go. What's your name? Good morning, Pro, Professor Tijani. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Sunday Enem from Academic Office. Okay. Please allow me to stand on the existing protocol. My question goes to the Professor Jobson. Professor Jobson, thank you so much for that lecture. If I had not joined this meeting, I would not have known the importance of consuming rabbit, the rabbit meat. My question is, please, Pro, what awareness program has been put in place to educate the populace about the health benefits of this rabbit? Because if you go to the market, most meat that people consume is, uh, is either beef, goat meat, chicken. I'm very sure the common man out there do not know the health benefits of this rabbit meat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, you spoke my mind. I never questioned my great, great granny, the last chief Kakawa of uh, the Kakawa Shetans in Lagos Island, that would always send me to buy rabbit and give to one of the wives to cook. And I will carry and bring back. But I never partake in eating it because I have no clue. But the man lived to be 100 and I think he died at 121, okay, in 1977. So, so thank you very much for that question. The next person should please, I ask you to unmute, Adama or Adawa something, unmute yourself, please. Okay, Professor Kagbari, I will unmute you, sir. Hello? Okay, go ahead, sir. Adama. Good morning, sir. It's Adawa, sir. It's not... Adawa, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, Prof, ma. I want to know because when you yes, talked sir. about the when you talked about the rabbit, all I saw is a uh, hybrid imported ones, and uh, nothing was talked about the bush rabbit we have. Are they having the same nutritional value or? The bush rabbit we have in Nigeria, there has not been much research to that effect to know its nutritional value in relation to the imported one. That is one. Second, I wouldn't know if there had been any attempt in hybriding the bush 
rabbit with uh, the hybrid we have abroad or that has been introduced just like we have with, in the cattle section. And finally, Ma, I want to know what is the cost implication of running, if possible, in terms of production chain for the rabbit. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much. Uh, kindly mute yourself. And I will read this one on uh, chat uh, room before I allow Professor Kagbari and then uh, Professor Uba Adamu to take the floor. It's from uh, Malam Abubakar Surajo Ringim. Uh, he said he's uh, with Asu something, something. So he posted something here. Uh, he said, one, I have two questions. One, I have been hearing that UDA, UDA, breed are hard to keep that is domesticated in bracket compare with other breeds is this true please secondly what are the drawbacks in goat and sheep farming thanks for sharing your experience on this ma so at this point let me uh, prof i believe you are noting everything you answer all together let me unmute uh uh, the director of LSS, Professor Kagbari. Uh, you can unmute, sir. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Oh, <laughs> I think you, you press the button again. Unmute now again. Professor Kagbari, I've asked you to unmute. We can't hear you, sir. Okay. Let's try it again. Okay. Can you admit now? Okay. All right. Yeah, you're good. Right. Now. Now. Uh, well, just to thank uh, Professor Jokchan for uh, the presentation and bringing the awareness uh, of the community to uh, meet from rabbit and, um, and goat, the various nutritional values. Uh, because it's one thing that in this country, really, um, rabbit meat has been eradicated for a very long time, even though there's a lot of potential uh, in it. So I'm sure that uh, with the growing awareness, uh, um, return on investment because of the high fecundity, that is the high uh, reproductive uh, uh, rate. So I, I thank uh, the directorate for bringing this to the fore. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well, in Yoruba language, we said uh, we are often uh, you can unmute your, mute yourself, sir. We will say Egunla There are two Egunlas here. I will not interpret until you until I hear a lot in dollars for those who would like me to interpret that. But the first Egunla that is being Bale now is uh, our distinguished uh, double professor and the vice chancellor, and in fact, the visioner of this center, the one that see it fit and they allow us to flower, to exchange intellectual uh, uh, scholarship, Professor Abdallah Uba Adamo to kindly speak to us. Uh, and thank after you very that, we'll listen to Obolo. Well, thank, thank you very sir. much. Uh, thank you very much, Director, for this. I see that my prayer is close to the old man, sitting in his usual chair as usual. Uh, well, today we're not talking about dead white philosophers, we're talking about uh, something more nutritious. Now, uh, Professor Jokstan's uh, presentation is very revelatory because it's like for most people, we don't, we don't really, I, I can't even remember the last time I saw a rabbit anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, probably because I can't remember the last time I actually entered the market. I'm not a person who likes intermingling with a lot of people, so I, I, I allow my better half to do all that. 
So I, I really don't care what is placed on my table, whether it is a rabbit or whether it is a, a chicken or whatever it is. But I think it's very good that we know that there are alternative sources of, of meat and which, which is probably fairly cheap because of the way it produce, it is produced. Now, I just want to draw attention to one thing. This lecture seems to be a combination of two things, or even three. Hmm. There is the migratory element, then there is the, the, the health nutrition uh, element, and then there is a public uh, nutrition element. I would have uh, loved, for instance, a much more focus on, first, she, she does it on migratory pattern. But as a biologist, I wanted to know what are the ecological impacts of, of this migration of animals into new ecosystems? How do they impact the ecosystem that they found? Because we're talking about a migratory corridor that, that lasts thousands of years. Within those thousands of years, how has the ecology and the ecosystem of, of the recipient or transitory or migratory route changed, altered? and particularly the food production. How has the, the presence of rabbits in any local community impact on the ecosystem and impact on the food chain? And then we can also, of course, look at the economic productivity. How does it also affect the economic production? Because I didn't see data that deals with uh, uh, relationship, the entire relationship between a rabbit and other animals. For instance, grass. A rabbit is grass probably, so is there any danger to a particular species of grass as a result of rabbit production? Uh, what about wild rabbits? Mm. Do they create, uh, 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 they, do they become magnets for certain kind of insects or can, 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 certain kind of ticks? In other words, I, I see this more on the relationship between migratory animals and their impact on the ecosystem and their relationship on the food chain. As, as a biologist, I will, that, that would be my focus. But then we will have the people from public health who will now cooperate with uh, Professor Jackson to look at the health benefits of all these migratory animals so that we divorce the health benefits from the migratory focus. Because somebody who is purely in social sciences or somebody who is only interested in cultural studies may only be looking at the migratory aspect, but may not be too keen on the, on the amount of proteins, uh, part calcium, phosphorus, and all that in, in, in the animals. So this is... Well, I, I think, uh, Professor Jackson, if you are tweaking this paper up, I would suggest probably, probably you focus on one or two things or create clear demarcation between the two papers. There is a, a paper that looks at the migratory patterns of animals and how they move from one ecology to another and how they impact on that particular ecology. Uh, for instance, in the US now, one of the biggest problem is uh, killer harness. Uh, harness. Uh, these are killer hornets that are imported somehow or the others through a fruit or something like that. When you travel across the world, in any airport you go, they will ask you, do you have any fruits or vegetables? The reason is because you may have an insect in a fruit or vegetable that will have an impact on the ecology of the country that you are going. It might destroy their ecology. We had uh, in Kano some time ago uh, a plague of American cockroaches. These are tiny cockroaches that breed and, uh, and, and, and they, did, they really are horrible. And they were brought as a result of one of our colleagues coming from the US and he brought it in his, his, in his luggage. And the next thing you know, the damn thing was spreading all over the place. So I, I, I think we have, we, to me, there are two papers here. A paper that deals with migration of animals, but it didn't look at the impact on their ecosystem, of their, of their impact on ecosystems where they have finally domesticated themselves. A paper that looks at the, the nutritional value of imported or migratory animals. I, I think there's a need for us to create a dividing line between these two. But otherwise, uh, brilliant. And now I'll start asking uh, someone to buy uh, rabbit meat for me. I've never eaten rabbit. So I, <laughs> this will be a good opportunity to start. Thank you very much, uh, Director. Th thank you very much, sir. Uh, with your permission, uh, we will spend the next 10 minutes, allow Professor Jokton to, to respond. But before she does, I think uh, the challenge that uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor has given us, and with your permission, let me use that office title, sir, uh, is the fact that uh, we have potential, a great potential, 
in uh, multidisciplinary research uh, in this context. And more importantly, we have an opportunity to begin to influence policy and regulatory uh, measures by the government. And indeed, before the year runs out, we will be coming out with the third, uh, 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 what do I call it now, quarterly report. So we'll do a combined we'll submit. Uh, but I'm challenging uh, those of us here present and those that are not to work with uh, Professor Jokton. If you're in history, if you're in agriculture, biology, health, sciences, environmental sciences, I think we can and uh, we should. In fact, we can pursue a grant to work on this. I wanted to show uh, something before uh, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Sogolo speaks, uh, and it has to do with something that I discovered in the archives some years back uh, when the country was still under the colonial uh, administration. Oh, it's not sharing. It's not sharing. It's, un it's unfortunate. I don't know why it's not sharing, but uh, I will share with uh, Professor Doctor. It has to do with the British government having an established a sustainable exhibition every year after World War II. And Nigeria was classified as the most important colony and protectorate. But more importantly, the, the, the benefit therein in terms of what Professor Doctor as presented to us in 2020. And I could see a lot of doctoral thesis coming out of this. And that is why I'm encouraging some of these uh, students on uh, doing their PhD. Some of them are in uh, environmental science. They should take advantage and also reach out for mentoring. So at this point, let me, uh, let's listen to Professor Sogolo and then Professor Joktan can, uh, 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 respond and then we can close the show. Uh, I'm looking for Professor Sogolo. Okay. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. I've asked you to unmute, kindly unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much, uh, uh, Prof. No, first of all, let me say, where, where has the Professor uh, Abdallah Adamuba been? Because all along we've been going on, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, he's still around. Please, mm. uh, I thought he had run away before before his time ends up. He should, he should always be around. Because <laughs> it's, I, it's been I, busy, I, sir, and he sent his apologies <laughs> all the time. I think I mentioned his apologies. Oh no, 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 no. That's <laughs> because I, when I listen to him, I get uh, somehow excited always. Uh, you see, the point has just been made. And, and the, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Professor Jota for this very brilliant uh, presentation. The point he has made, which really is very interesting to me, is the nutritional value of rabbits, uh, which according to her uh, is high. And then that the rabbit is also low in cholesterol level and low in fat. Now, for old people like us, these are the things we really need. But my confusion is that I really, up to now, did not know that there's so much, or there are so much rabbits in this country. Because she, she was talking about 1.7 million rabbits, if, if I, I'm correct about those figures. If they are, where are they? Because I've never... Uh, well, I, I really like uh, uh, Professor uh, Ubadamu. I don't go to the market, but my people don't bring rabbits home, and so I've not I've not been eating rabbit. If the figures are correct, I would very much like to eat rabbit again. I want to congratulate this center for taking us to a totally new experience. And that's what scholarship is all about. Today's presentation has totally given us uh, something new. And uh, uh, 
Professor Adamo, before you leave, we want to congratulate you for this thing that you have done here. And also uh, Professor Tijani for keeping up the center. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, ma. Can yes, ma'am. We can. We can hear you. Yes. Prof, are you still on Acetel now? We can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, and. Um, I would like to respond to the issues and yeah, I, I would like to uh, thank you for all the questions raised. Uh, the first one is on whether goat meat could uh, answer that by saying that the table I presented speaks differently. The data indicates that it's not the most nutritious meat. And so you can also check by yourself. You can Google and find out the various uh, nutrient value of uh, other uh, livestock. But goat meat is good. You can use it because it is uh, sheep meat in terms of total protein and total fat content. It has its own advantages, but it now depends on what you are looking at. If you are looking at the issue of low cholesterol, you are looking at the issue of high mineral value, then you don't choose that. You now choose another one that has that. If you are looking at white meat and you are probably looking at concentration of unsaturated fats, you may decide to go for uh, fish. You can decide to go for rabbits. So I should say that you will look at the livestock product in relation to what we want. We cannot at this point probably say one is bad compared to the other, but certain pro, uh, nutritional value varies and that should inform the decision we have as to what meat to take. So if you are asking if it has as high a protein value as the rabbit, I will say the answer is no. So that is on that. And then the next question is on the awareness there is, actu there is actually the need to increase awareness as to the value of these animals, especially today that the, the standard of living is falling and people cannot meet the nutritional requirement in their diets. And so this class of animals can be raised by anybody, they do not need a special uh, feed, maybe like the poultry that you have to compound, like the pigs, like you have to do, they can, as well as uh, household uh, waste. And therefore, smallholder homes resources can actually raise these animals. In fact, that is one of the major reasons why it was moved all over the place because they could keep it on and it is quiet. It doesn't make noise and it can be confined to a small place. I had earlier on worked with the states of uh, Kano, Abia, Bauchi, and, uh, and um, Zamf um, no, not Zamf um, Katsina State with the ADPs on creating awareness for these uh, animals. And I think we should not leave that. The Nigerian Institute of Animal Science is also taking that up as part of the micro livestock that they need to push forward so that people can be aware and raise that up. But we cannot do enough in terms of getting to the grassroots to enable the, the people that are most vulnerable understand the advantage then uh, he asked about the, the, the indigenous uh, rabbits. The indigenous one that you see in the bush is actually the hare. 
is not a rabbit. And that is entirely different in, in, from the rabbit. In fact, they are genetically different and crossbreeding does not necessarily occur within that class because there are two different classes. And this paper is referring to the domestic rabbit. That's why I kept saying the domestic rabbit that has the name Oritolagus coniculus. That is not the name of the hare that we see in the, in the bush. Then we look at, um, in terms of cost implication of raising rabbits, I would say that it is, it is not expensive because with as little as 3,000, one can buy a male and female rabbit or even less. And you can use the household byproduct and any small uh, area within the house you can keep it. But it's important to know that the rabbit is a borrower. And so if you keep it on the, on the, uh, and in an open space, it will dig a hole and it will go out of the compound and you find it somewhere. So it is advisable that we normally provide cages for it so that it actually does not uh, go somewhere. But the cost of starting the farm is not high. It doesn't need any special or extensive housing to start and does not also need very special feeding. It, however, requires cleanliness and maintenance of the environment. I'm sure you know that the rabbit, uh, the rabbit urine is yellowish and uh, a bit smelly, and therefore the environment where it is needs to be kept clean so that it doesn't uh, create too much odor. The feces are okay because they are hard and dry and does not constitute any serious uh, odor around the environment. Uh, order are hard to keep. Okay. He said the Uda breed is hard to keep. I would like to also say that the Uda is actually from the north eastern part of the country where there are there is a lot of water. It's actually an animal that can swim uh, within the lectured basin. And so uh, if you, it, it suffers some adaptability issues when it is brought to uh, the wet environment because it is more of a dry uh, animal. And so if you need to keep it within this our environment, it means you need to do a little more to ensure that the environment is dry, it is not living in a damp or humid room because those are factors that can bring it down but other than that i don't think it has any any much difficulty different from the other breeds of uh, of sheep that uh, that you may find they are also big breeds and they have high premium in the market particularly during festivals people buy them for for high prices so it's good to engage in those ones particularly for festivities to, to raise income. If we, they are asking if we have any drawback in goat uh, sheep and goat keeping. Yes, I will say, you know, the goat is a troublesome animal. It doesn't stay in one place. And so when you, when you are keeping it, then it means you should ensure that it does not run to your neighbor to actually cause too much trouble. That is one of the major issues relating to goat rearing. Sheep are a little more timid and can be easily managed, but the goat can jump a lot of fence before you know it is eating your, your neighbor's uh, uh, something that is being dried outside and so on and so forth. So in terms of managing them, we should uh, be careful. A lot of them are raised under the extensive system. You just allow them to roam about. But that is the reason for the low productivity. Should you be interested in a commercial venture, then extensive management system is not the best option for you to take because it creates conflicts. And with the way things are, nobody wants reasons for conflict. We have enough stress around the environment. As, as it is. In, um, in terms of uh, the comment made by the vice chancellor, 
Yes, I agree with you that there are issues of ecology as you move animals from one place to another. How do they impact on the ecology? How do they also impact on the existing uh, livestock? I, the paper is actually addressing the diversity of uh, the diversity, the, the coming of uh, rabbits and small ruminants has brought to the environment. But yes, we can choose to look at the ecology of it. It's, we can also uh, look at and see the, the danger. Like I gave an example, when it was introduced to Australia, before you know it, it's an advantage because the number that was they have, they have multiplied to had to be taken care of. And so they had to introduce a virus to even be able to control the population of the, the rabbits. So those are some ecological factors that we can actually study, like, Dr. like Professor Tijani has said, I would be willing to look at other aspects of uh, this, uh, uh, um, other aspects that this discussion has brought so that we can see what the information we can do and design to find out more uh, going forward. So I thank you for opening our eyes to, to that aspect. On the issue of um, um, the number of rabbits available, Professor Emeretu said he didn't know that we have up to that. Actually, we do, but the rabbits are quiet and so are the rearers. Most of the rabbits are raised by households. They are within the household setting. And so you see children raising some of them, or you see adults raising some of them. There are household data that indicates the number of rabbits uh, among households in Nigeria. It's not very glaring outside, but if you go to the market, there are cages for rabbits. And people that are interested actually uh, go for them and order for them. There is also online. If you check online, you see a lot of uh, rabbit uh, farms that are actually online and advertising what they have. And you could also engage with them either to get parent stock or to purchase for meat. Now, it's important for me to add at this point that if you want to buy the parent store, then you need to be careful where you are buying it from. Some of the local crossbred uh, breeds available are not very productive in, in terms of prolific, being prolific. Their litter size may be like four or five, but if you take a bit of time to actually look for a foundation's uh, head from the right place, you will be able to get it. There are research institute, institutes that have, there are commercial farms that are now into the rearing of these animals and uh, you can get the information uh, online. I think if I'm not, uh, I think maybe this is about what I got as the question yes, raised. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. We, we appreciate you. And thank you very much for a brilliant presentation and uh, response. Uh, before I close today, I would like us to think about collaborating, uh, that is the CEMGS and ESETEL, and uh, individually or as a faculty. Uh, we can do a concept note or proposal because there are grants out there. And I'll tell you about one mm. uh, because I know about it. Uh, uh, I'm currently a co-lead on the, the National COVID-19 Research Consortium uh, funded by Ted Fund and uh, Dangote. Uh, on the advisory board, you know, one is opportune to be there too. And I know that we are seeking uh, concept notes as well as a proposal. Uh, uh, if you, if we can work on something, we can turn it around and get some grants, and uh, you know, uh, thereby, you know, aid the web metrics of uh, of NOUN. Uh, on this note, I would like to thank every one of you uh, 
especially for coming and staying with us thus far. We've uh, really uh, spent be beyond our, our one hour schedule, but I think it's worth it. And we have the blessings of uh, both the, the vision of this center, uh, Professor Abdallah Adamu and uh, our Baba in the house, Professor Emeritus Godwin Sogolo. I thank each, each one of you. I thank uh, the director of audit. You know, I have to mention her name. And Mrs. Ajayi has been so consistently uh, participating and a few other uh, non-teaching, you know, uh, we really appreciate you. God bless you. And uh, I think uh, we will sign out by saying, Eshe Adupe Nagode. Bye-bye. See you next Thank week. You. It's the last presentation by Professor Rubek from University of Army, from uh, Academy of Sciences uh, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, that will be the last for the year, so that December we can concentrate on the fourth journal uh, of the center. So we'll see you Monday for the last presentation by Professor Ruby, the Director of Global Studies at the Czechoslovakia Academy of Science. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.